When I was 21, I started volunteering in an insect ecology lab. This is where I met Jay. He was tall, with pale skin, dark hair, and green eyes. As a diehard Garden State fan, I loved the fact that he looked like Zach Braff. <laughs> in lab, Jay and I worked together to identify and pin hundreds of insects. This was the perfect backdrop for geeking out about Pokemon, Mantis Shrimp, and the Christmas Island Crab Migration. <laughs> I'd never met a cute guy who was as passionate about his hobbies and interests as I was before. And by hobbies and interests, I really mean hyperfixations and special interests, <laughs> though neither of us realized we were neurodivergent yet. Soon we started spending time together outside of lab, first to catch pet crayfish, then to tide pool. Jay let me decide how far we'd go across the slippery rocks, as he always wanted me to feel safe. As we searched for shrimp and crabs, I was struck by his positive outlook and our shared commitment to conservation and sustainability. After several months, uncertainty over if this was romantic was driving me out of my mind. <sighs> Jay had an air of nerdy innocence about him, and I wasn't sure that he knew the copious baked goods that I brought into lab were my attempts at flirting. <laughs> when I finally asked Jay how he saw me, he confessed, I'm viscerally attracted to you. But I'm not in the right place for a relationship right now. <sighs> that lasted all of two weeks. All I had to do was send him this sexy picture, and he was mine. <laughs> At the age of 21, I finally had my first boyfriend and my first kiss. It took me a while to relax and enjoy it, but I quickly became an enthusiastic makeout partner. <laughs> However, Jay started pushing to take things further even after I had said no. About a month into the relationship, he requested a hand job as a birthday present for his grandmother. Let me explain. See, it was her birthday month too, and it made her happy to see him happy. <laughs> and it would make him extremely happy if I would touch his penis. <sighs> I should have run, but I didn't know about consent back then. I thought it was my job to get comfortable, when in reality, it was his job to respect my boundaries. I'm demisexual, meaning that I need a strong emotional bond before I experience sexual attraction, and it took me a few months to get there. After that, I was fully on board. After we'd been together about four months, Jay suggested we take a backpacking trip to Joshua Tree. Just a few days before the trip, I got sick. Having gone a couple of days without eating more than a Jamba Juice smoothie, I texted Jay to reschedule. He replied, I can't believe you do this to me. I convinced myself that this was the sort of misunderstanding that all couples needed to work through, so I was quick to get over the fact that he was more concerned about a camping trip than my health. I thought that our relationship was good. We skipped evening classes to make out in my bed. We searched marshes for fiddler crabs. And we attended nerd conventions throughout Southern California. We were living a life of adventure. Nine months after we'd started dating, Jay and I were headed off on our biggest adventure yet, a Hawaiian vacation. I'd be leaving for grad school shortly after our trip, so I wanted to make the most of our time together. Although we'd be scuba diving for most of our days on Maui, we had a number of shore days planned as well, and hikes weren't the only thing I was looking forward to. We had a whole condo to ourselves. We were going to be long distance soon, and unlike it, his house, portraits of his heroes, Carl Sagan and Charles Darwin, weren't watching. <laughs> I expected this vacation to be Sex City. Day after day, though, things stayed G-rated. 
Jay alternated between watching random TV, such as coverage of a bank robber who was throwing money from the getaway car, and reading about Hawaii's awful colonial past and present, which dampened his mood and correspondingly his sex drive. Over the course of this 10-day vacation, we had sex once and the condom broke, sending me into a panic despite the fact that I was on birth control. Rather than validating my fears, Jay was annoyed by my bad mood. We managed to move on from that, rejoicing at finding crabs at sunset, marveling at breathtaking views from the cliffside highway that hugs Maui's northwest shore. One night, Jay was getting ready for a dive when we started arguing about what time we needed to leave the next morning. You know, something minor. I was following Jay through the condo when he spun around and grabbed me, hard. At first I assumed he was joking, but the cold look on his face revealed otherwise. He was six foot two, 200 pounds, and mad. Thankfully, that ended as suddenly as it had started but I was left trying to reconcile this violent outburst with everything I loved about our relationship. Our shared passion for saving the environment, the late nights watching Robot Chicken, the way we called each other Turtle as a nickname, as in, I like turtles. I didn't know if I'd find that again, so I stayed. Just a few weeks after we returned from Hawaii, I left for grad school. At Jay's insistence, I furnished my apartment in Ikea black-brown furniture so it would match his, even though I was more of a maple person myself. I flew back monthly, only for him to be more excited to have enough players for long, complex board games than to spend time with me. This was especially evident the time he answered his phone during sex, <sighs> pulling out so he could make plans to play Game of Thrones. After a year of long distance, Jay moved in with me. Things were largely harmonious until one evening when we were on the couch with my rats, Spike and Lionel. Out of nowhere, Jay roughly grabbed Spike, yelled, I'm so sick of you, and dropped him. Faced with my outrage, Jay insisted, he's fine. He didn't get it. He never got it. In Jay's mind, if there were no permanent, tangible consequences for his actions, he hadn't done anything wrong. Later, after we moved to the South for his graduate program, he'd tell me that it was fine that he was driving with no hands on the wheel. He'd tell me it was fine that he was spray painting indoors. He'd tell me it was fine that he'd let my cats run out of water while I was on vacation. After all, Nobody had died, had they? Constantly having my concerns dismissed infuriated me, but I knew that nobody was perfect, and I figured that these were the sorts of things people meant when they said that relationships take work. Besides, I had an extremely difficult time making friends after undergrad, and Jay formed the vast majority of my support network. I didn't fit in, and I hid my true self from nearly everyone, but I could be unapologetically me with Jay. Lacking friends, unhappy at work, and 2,000 miles from my family, I wasn't about to leave my boyfriend, so I chose to focus on the good things, like our countless inside jokes and how much we enjoyed watching Pokemon together, all snuggled up, which relaxed me so much that I'd fall asleep. Having a live-in cuddle buddy was a dream come true. But then I'd remember the way he'd grabbed me that time and how he'd treated Spike, and I'd panic. So I'd push those memories back beneath the surface, wanting to believe that Jay had changed and that I could get past it. Also, I didn't want to have to fight for custody of our isopod plushes. <laughs> in the ninth year of our relationship and our sixth year in the South, COVID happened. Jay became nocturnal and didn't want to spend time with me beyond watching Clone Wars or inviting me to snuggle up as he played Animal Crossing. Then it was back to his office to chat with online friends and listen to far left podcasts. I gave up on asking for sex. Getting turned down during my monthly request, time after time, 
hurt too much. He told me we could discuss it after the dissertation, you know, like in a few years. A few months into the pandemic, I unexpectedly found myself on the job market. Amazingly, I quickly found a listing for my dream job. The catch, it was in San Diego. <laughs> no, you see, that wasn't going to work. Jay was going to be at the whims of the academic job market once he graduated, and the odds of him finding a position in SD were next to nothing. But as I was job hunting, I got aboard the Marie Kondo bandwagon. As I was asking myself if every book I'd collected still sparked joy, I realized that my relationship no longer sparked joy. I decided to apply for that job. As I advanced through the interview process, I asked Jay if he'd join me in California once he completed his lab work. Nah, he said. I'm over San Diego. For all those years, I'd put up with the things Jay did because I'd heard that relationships take work. I've since learned that this is not the kind of work they're talking about. The work in healthy relationships is offering emotional support on hard days. It's taking care of your partner when they're sick. It's making time for them even when you're stretched thin. Those things never felt like work to me, so I didn't realize that they should have been enough. I see now that fear kept me in that relationship. Fear that I'd never find a better partner. Fear that I couldn't handle living alone. Fear that I wouldn't get custody of all my favorite stuffed animals. Despite having aced my econ classes in college, I'd fallen victim to the sunk cost fallacy. I had dreams of living back in California, near family, near the ocean, in an apartment full of beautiful wooden furniture, none of that cheap black brown stuff. But I dismissed those dreams as fantasies. They were incompatible with life with Jay. I took the job.